Thank you, Allison. It's just absolutely wonderful to be here, and I so appreciate um, Canadian Cancer Survivors Network uh, participation and facilitation here. Uh, I'm just going to um, minimize that. There we go. Good. Um, and for reflecting on this talk, so welcome everybody. First of all, uh, this is a talk that's taken 30 years for me to produce, and I recognize that even though I'm reviewing the book Radical Remission, I recognize actually this question of what people can do to really facilitate healing, to really make a difference in body, mind, and spirit has really driven me as an individual for now over 30 years when I was a medical student and deciding on what type of career I wanted to go into. And um, what I want to do is offer you a, a bigger perspective on what you can do to empower yourself. And to, to start that off, I want to talk about what, what are people's goals. So having run over 50 retreats and given hundreds of public talks and you know, uh, worked with thousands of patients, I, I, my belief is that most people who have had a cancer diagnosis want three basic things, and this is what we want to work towards. One is they want to maximize their chance of recovery, and that could be for cure, it could be for longevity, um, if, if that's how it's going to be. The second thing is, and it's pretty obvious, that people want to feel better emotionally. All the incredible angst and uh, the, sh the feeling of being shattered uh, at the start of diagnosis and so on is incredibly difficult. And so we want to come home and want to feel better, more grounded uh, sense of peace. Uh, coming back to ourselves. So that's the other major goal. And lastly, in the last couple of years, I've recognized that people want to be able to function better as well. And, um, uh, you know, not only just kind of physically being able to do the things, but to be able to think more clearly. And what I'm trying to offer you today in, in, in bringing it through uh, the medium of the remarkable cancer survivors, what you can do to empower yourself, some really kind of practical things. I, um, uh, was speaking with uh, a woman I've known for about uh, 10 or 12 years. Uh, she lives in uh, the Hamilton area, worked in the pharmaceutical industry, and then recently she got a breast cancer diagnosis and went through chemotherapy, you know, big surgery, and now is finishing her radiation. And like many people, um, you know, trying to figure out those next steps, what can you do after the kind of physical care uh, to really make a difference in our lives. And one of the advice that I offered her is actually to to reach out to uh, the universe in some sense. It could be through prayer, it could be through setting intention, but to ask for direction, to be able to listen to what's best for you. And so when I present today, I also uh, have that same kind of feeling. I'm going to offer you the options, like a smorgasbord of ideas. And the ideas that resonate for you, uh, you know, you can pursue and see if you can integrate them into your healing program. And so I offer that in terms of recognizing that not everything I'm going to say is going to pertain to each person, but it, uh, it can be incredibly powerful if you're willing to ask for direction, ask for what you as a person need to do, and to even ask how to ask. You know, the prayer could be, teach me how to pray so I can figure out what is you know, what, what I can actually do and really make a difference. Um, I also um, want to uh, recommend, and again, you as an individual may not uh, decide this, but I actually believe in what I call integrative medicine, which is getting the best care from the medical system and what that can provide, and then what you can do on the other side of that body, mind, and spirit. Uh, and it's that combination, it's the marriage of those two that can really have a profound influence on your health and happiness. So I'm going to use that kind of uh, mechanism of both worlds. Um, and so at the highest level, if you're going to get complete care, it's important to understand what's happening, understand the medical system, and then be able to get the best care from the medical system by advocating for yourself and, and understanding how it works and so on. And that's that's probably about a half an hour talk by itself, but this is part of the bigger process. And then there's the empowerment piece, changing the soup, empowering the body, allowing the natural healing mechanism from the body to allow for healing to happen. There's then working with the mind, uh, because the mind and body, are it's one unit, and so as you change your thoughts, your stress patterns, et cetera, et cetera, 
you can have a profound influence on the kind of healing level of the body, and you'll be happier too. And lastly, it's the idea of nurturing a spiritual perspective. And we'll touch on that because it's part of the this radical uh, remissions project. So, so this is what I endorse. So even though some of the radical remission survivors that you may read about uh, decided not to do medical treatment, I do say at least get the information, go in, understand the pros and cons to every option, and and make a good decision based on that. So I'm endorsing both, the both both worlds. Um, so the reason why I'm seeing this talk took 30 years to develop is um, uh, I read that first book, Love, Medicine, and Miracles, in the 1980s when I was going to medical school at the University of Toronto. And that was the book that said, aha, this is it. This is what I want to do. I want to be an oncologist. I want to run support groups. Uh, and I'm really, um, you know, it was the first exposure to the exceptional cancer patients. I'm going to talk about that. And then I, I recognize as well that, um, you know, this work has been done for really decades. And I would happen to be lucky enough to meet Alistair Cunningham and to learn from him and to read his book called Can the Mind Heal Cancer? Because he was really talking about what are the qualities of the people who do exceptionally well? And he, he studied that in a prospective manner. And I'm going to share that uh, teaching with you as well. And uh, next was being able to hook up with um, an amazing physician in Vancouver who co-founded Inspire Health. And I'll tap into some of his teaching. And lastly, the book was Radical Remissions by Kelly Turner, which really um, prompted this talk as a medium to empower you, to give you the perspective of, so if you can do incredibly well, what sorts of things can you do? How can you live your life in such a way that it really empowers the body, really um, enhances your healing capacity to, to, do, to be one of these exceptional uh, people and to be happier and, and healthier in the long term? So this is my perspective of kind of sharing, sharing the story of, um, of, of my, my teaching. So. The book was released a couple years ago called Radical Remission. You see Kelly Turner's picture there. And what happened was Kelly um, was a Harvard grad. She was counseling cancer patients as a kind of psychologist. And then she had that kind of aha moment reading a, uh, a book called Spontaneous Healing by Andrew Wheel. And she thought, well, what is it that that the people who do incredibly well, what do they do? And she got really excited by trying to figure this out. And she went to the literature and found that there were over a thousand cases of um, in the medical literature of the physicians, uh, you know, writing, you know, this person had a cancer diagnosis, we couldn't treat them anymore. And yet they did something and their, t their tumor spontaneously regressed and they've done incredibly well, way beyond any expectation. And Kelly quickly says she doesn't like the word spontaneous because not one of her cases was really like, you know, the person kind of you know, had a meditation session and then suddenly their tumors were gone. It was more like they had a radical change in their perspective, a radical change in their lifestyle. They worked hard to actually manifest the healing within their lives. And so she calls it radical remission. And so what she did, she was inspired by this and recognized that nobody had, you know, at least she hadn't come into anybody kind of studying it um, more systematically. And so she underwent going around the world and interviewing, it was about 100 people who've undergone a, a radical remission. So somebody who either uh, had foregone any type of conventional treatment or whose conventional treatment finished and there were no other options and in both situations, their cancers were grasped and they did uh, well in terms of having, never, never having a cancer come back. So that was what she defined as a radical remission. And she simply asked each person in turn, you know, put on the tape recorder, recorded their conversation for an hour, and she would ask the question, why do you think she healed? And she would listen for the hour. Uh, occasionally, she would ask a question at the end just to kind of clarify a few points. And then she did what they call qualitative um, analysis which is looking at the themes that are coming out for the from these uh, remarkable cancer survivor stories and she also interviewed uh, healers throughout the world as well and then she got out 75 factors so through the thematic analysis there were 75 factors that she could identify from all those 
kind of hundred transcripts. And then what she found that there were nine key factors that were common to like every single person who had undergone this had actually done these key factors. And that's what I'd like to share with you today and, and to show you the overlap between what she's reporting and what I've experienced and seen through Bernie Seeger, Alistair Cunningham, and so on. There seems to be a pattern uh, there of the people to, who do exceptionally well. And um, and, it's, and she's quite clear, and I'm, I want to be clear as well, is that you know you can follow these nine key factors and it's there's no kind of guarantee uh, that you know things will get better for you from a kind of cancer perspective. So I want to kind of leave that aside and, and really concentrate on what can we learn about how to live our lives and put ourselves into that space and the paradox of not trying too hard in order to to manifest a kind of physical healing. So, so that's the perspective. So I'm going to review her book. And uh, so the nine key factors are listed here. I'm going to go through them uh, one by one and put them within context of, um, uh, you know, how you can apply that on a day-to-day. And you'll notice that only a couple of them are actually physical things. So change in diet, use of herbs and supplements are the kind of physical things you might be able to change within your life. But the vast majority are actually, um, you know, psychological, spiritual uh, manifestations. And so we'll, we'll discuss uh, that as well. So I'm just giving you the, the background of what I'm going to try to discuss. And I tell it through this the medium of my story as a physician over the last 30 years, exploring what people do to really help facilitate healing in every sense. Um, one of the things that I think is extremely important is to actually uh, set an intention. So, to, and it, this is this is uh, an overlap with the positive psychology world. Um, uh, so, I've become quite interested in that as well. So, how do people? Um, manifest happiness? How do they facilitate that? How do they plan their lives? How do they live their lives? What are behaviors, actions, ideas, attitudes that allow them to experience that sense of happiness? Because I believe that when the body's in that state, it facilitates a natural healing. Uh, and again, there are things you can do to kind of improve the kind of emotional weather within your life. And so you'll see in the screen here, it's a book written by a couple of couple of corporate trainers, Foster and Hicks, and they wrote a book, The Nine Choices of Extremely Happy People, and they had an idea that people from around the world would manifest happiness in different ways, and they set about again, look, it's like 60, 80 countries, some, some great number of countries, and they would go into a village, for instance, they would go to the first person that they um, met and they say, can you point me to a really happy person? And uh, and then they say, oh, someone will say, yeah, yeah, I know, I know Uncle Giuseppe or Auntie Maria. See, they live up in that cabin up there. And eventually, they get pointed to one of these amazingly happy, incredibly grateful, wise people. And they would knock on their door, and inevitably, they would get invited in, and they, they would actually start the interview and interview these happy people from all around the world. Now, incredibly, it was very consistent. Cross-cultural people that are happy have the following. Um, attitudes and beliefs and actions, and it overlaps very clearly with the remarkable cancer survivors. So they set an intention to be happy. So actually, life is a choice in some sense that we can actually work towards that. So they set an intention. They're accountable, right? They're not. They're not the finger's not pointing elsewhere. It's they recognize that it's their projection of the world. That determines their attitude towards the world. So they assume personal responsibility. They identify what makes them happy. They make it central to their life. So it's a choice again. So even when they go through very difficult problems, and these people had some of them had incredibly difficult lives, like you know going through you know child prostitution. There's all sorts of really awful stuff. But they would see that, reframe that, or uh, as an opportunity for. for they looked at options. They're open to new possibilities. And so I also bring that kind of attitude of being trained in Western medicine, but recognizing that there's so much more to this world and this experience of being human than, than the kind of physical world. And so I can be open to the Chinese medicine and the sense that spirit consciousness can actually influence the physicality 
you know, so we can be open to those possibilities as well. Gratitude is a you know, very, very common attribute of very happy people. And despite of the difficulties within their lives, you know, is the glass half full or half empty? They give, actually they see others' interests as their own interests, for instance. Um, and interesting, this idea of truthfulness. Like, I say it's kind of like authenticity. You're honest with yourself. You're honest with others. And it just takes off a whole le level of kind of stress and, and tension when we can just be open and real in some sense. So I'm giving you that whole big blurb just to say that I just want to spend 30 seconds right now doing a little um, exercise that I call setting the intention because I believe that setting the intention is the first step to uh, the healing process and the healing journey. And so you can set your intention to heal. You can set your intention to be happier, healthier, and more grateful. And you know, also, also focus on the things that you have control over. So how is it you want to be in this world? What do you hope for yourself? And even think of this presentation that I'm continuing to give now. What is it that you hope to learn from this? And you kind of set your intention to be receptive to the wisdom that's there for you, right? So again, it's this idea of, so even going into a difficult situation, whether it's going to a doctor's office or you know to get some results or you know difficult presentation or dealing with difficult people or family member, you can always set your intention in the midst of it. So, so while you're here, I'm just going to take a few seconds just to do a very brief kind of relaxation meditation and then setting of intention. So, if you're sitting down, you can just bring your attention to your feet on the floor, the weight of the body in the chair, that kind of sense of solidness, you can straighten the spine a bit and feel that kind of sense of solid spine. Come to the front of your heart, the open heart. And the breath, just take a slow, deep breath and out breath. Just a few breaths there to come back home to yourself, to to let go of the thinking mind for a moment and simply come home to that sense of peace that's with us all the time. And then you can set that kind of sense of um, heartfulness. So think of somebody that you love and just feel that sense of compassion, that sense of peace, that sense of um, really caring for that person or a pet or at a different time in life, and just allow your heart to warm. And think of somebody in your life who's suffering in some way or form. So as you think of them, send them the kind of heart level prayer that they find healing, that they find peace, that they have a good outcome in some way or form. Right, and extend that out to your family and friends. Just allow those or your pets, whatever it is, allow your consciousness to extend out and just send your love to all of your loved ones, family and friends, and just send that out to anybody, anywhere who's suffering. From a limitless space of compassion in your heart. And then from that level, when you're in that space of heartfulness and groundedness, set an intention for yourself. What is it that you need to learn? How is it that you need to heal? What's there that you want to bring into this world? And then let it be so. Right? So this is something you can do first thing in the morning, just to allow that kind of sense of intention that kind of keeps you focused on what's most important, what you value most each day. So, so I think that's it's, it's beyond the nine key factors, but setting an intention, remembering what's most important, and coming back to that all day long, I want to manifest peace. I want to manifest love. I want to stay connected with the world, with my loved ones. Right? This is what's most important to me. So you choose that uh, on, on the moment to moment and the day to day. Okay, so setting intention is number one. I'm actually feeling a little bit better myself now. So thank you for going through this with me. Okay, so I want to start the story. Maybe I should take off my jacket here because I'm a little bit warm. My office here in Halifax. 
So in the 1980s, I read uh, Love, Medicine, and Miracles. Uh, one of those scenarios where the, the book kind of chooses the reader, because I was thinking about psychiatry and, and so on. And, um, and that book came into my hands, and I knew in my mind that I really, this was it. I, I knew that I wanted to be an oncologist. And uh, so you see Bernie's uh, picture there. So he was an Ivy League cancer surgeon, Yale. Um, but he was also running support groups and he was also sharing something deep within his spirit, his soul about teaching people how to live their lives beforehand. And he wrote in his book about exceptional cancer patients. In fact, you can probably see that in the title of the, the slide there. Uh, the patients who did incredibly well, essentially, whose tumors shrunk very quickly on treatment, who got through the very difficult treatments more better than expected, uh, who far outlived their doctor's expectations, uh, you know, people who have undergone spontaneous remission and so on. So he identified that there were certain kind of personality traits of his exceptional patient. And first of all, I take exception to the word exceptional because I think we all have that capacity. We all have the ability to empower ourselves and really make a difference in our lives. So it's not like them and us. It's like all of us. It's we, we can do this. Um, but Bernie um, talked about those, those the attributes of his remarkable patients. And the first one that he talked about was uh, acceptance. His remarkable patients were truly able to accept what was happening in their lives. And when I say acceptance, this is not a, it's not a sense of resignation, giving up, abdicating the responsibility, like you know, we're grasping. It's more like just being able to see the truth of the situation as it is. The reality, in fact, as a corollary right now, no matter how you're feeling emotionally right now, uh, you can kind of accept that's what where your starting point is, right? And so instead of struggling, oh, I shouldn't feel down, down I shouldn't feel anxious, you can be able to just accept, oh, this is where this is where my growing edge is. This is my starting place, and when we do that, it um, uh, it really um, uh, you know takes a, a, a sense of tension. It's a whole other layer of of kind of wrestling with reality. So you're kind of taking taking off the shackles in some sense, and so it's a very powerful place to start from. And I really didn't understand uh, Bernie's um, perspective until. Um, uh, 2006, actually, I'm just getting out my book right now. It's, um, it's a story of a, a woman who I was very close with in, in medical school, whose name is Karen. And um, we had kind of, you know, kind of parted past it in medical school. And then we were reconnected through social media, sharing the stories of her young families, you know, once a year Christmas letter and so on. And then in 2006, I got an email from Karen saying, uh, I want to talk with you. Uh, and I automatically thought, well, somebody in her family has a cancer diagnosis and they want to speak with the body, mind, spirit guy about what has happened and what, he, what we can do. And I got on the phone. It was actually Karen who had the diagnosis. And that first conversation was very difficult for me because that was my, my friend who had a breast cancer diagnosis, a big lump in her breast. And Armpit. She had undergone the surgery, had the breast removed at that point. And, um, but she was so, how do you say, uh, just so grounded, solid, pragmatic, matter of fact. She was just, you know, in some sense at peace. And I, would, it, I just so remarked at it. And I asked her about it. And she basically said, yeah, I was frustrated for a moment. But then I came to really accept the truth of the situation. And as she gained acceptance, her friends said to her, oh, Karen, you must be giving up because you don't seem very scared or worried. And then she finally had to send an email to everybody saying, this is how I'm perceiving the situation. And Karen was kind enough to um, share this uh, so I can print it in our book. So The Healing Circle, uh, and it's about her acceptance and acceptance of mortality. And this is what she wrote to her friends in an email. But once I managed to accept that the reality of my mortality had always been there, I could accept that nothing fundamental in my life had really changed with this diagnosis. I'm still the same me. 
my life has not changed drastically or dramatically. I'm still here. I was not hit by a bus. My loved ones are still around me. Unbelievably, I can honestly say that I'm as happy now as I was five weeks ago. I am, even in this moment, missing a body part or two, hair about to fall out, completely and utterly whole. And then she went on to write, and this allows me to see that the last few weeks and the year ahead as the first steps towards rather than a plunge from true wellness. I'll, there's some nuances here. Um, I'll continue on. Later on, she wrote, I suffered a couple of days of despair after the diagnosis, but since then I've known that I will be okay. Maybe not okay in the way I would have defined five weeks ago, but in a bigger sense. I felt that while I cannot be positive I will beat this, I can be positive that I will have the courage to face what is ahead. I am positive that I will have the support from loved ones, the expertise by my doctors, and ultimately the grace from God to ensure that this turn the road will not be a negative force in my life. And I believed all that and still believe that from deep within my soul. But here it is. But in the last two weeks, something else has crept in. I'm starting to believe or want to believe that I will beat this in the conventional sense. I'm starting to be reminded of myself and to ask it of God. There are a proportion of women who survive cancer in my stage. So why not? Right, so there is, a, a, what I'm trying to point to is some sense of paradox or tension. So the, the tension is to be able to accept the reality of the situation and be proactive, right? So she's, she's at peace with what's, what's happening and she's going to do everything that she can. She's changing her diet, she's getting the best treatment, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, chatted with Karen recently, she's great 12 years, 12 years later. But that, there's that tension, tension between staying in this moment, this wondrous moment, and planning for the future. Um, the tension between loving yourself as you are right now and wanting to grow as a person and to, and to expand spiritually. It's that kind of letting and getting, being and doing. It's, you kind of live that paradox. And it reminds me that one of, you know, this is probably the key point from the lecture. It's this. And the, the first key factor that I wanted to kind of point out to you, uh, which actually Kelly um, writes as the ninth factor, I think she's doing that just because um, uh, she wants to send you off on the, on the right note. It's having strong reasons for living. And, and so when she's going through the transcripts, it was pretty obvious that the people did it exceptionally well. They were saying they didn't want to die. But it wasn't, it wasn't this kind of um, uh, being driven by fear. It was more that they really had a reason to live. They really had a zest for living. And I'll just read a little bit. In fact, a few of them were completely unafraid of death, seeing it as nothing more than a transition to a different ex existence, which would happen whenever it was meant to happen. Until it happened, though, these people were very excited about the things they still wanted to do while they were alive in their bodies. So it's actually a huge takeaway point is to be able to accept the uncertainty of the future, to be able to live in this moment and not try to get um, you know, some outcome in the future. The outcome you can have is great here and now. And that's the paradox that I'm going to be talking about throughout. In fact, in Bernie's book, that was that was the second um, uh, attribute of his exceptional cancer patients, they um, they viewed uh, they sorry they did not view recurrence of their cancer or even death as a failure, right? So even though um, even though I I don't want you to die, I don't want you to have a recurrence of cancer. What I'm seeing is the remarkable cancer survivors didn't put their attention and energy at that level. They put their energy and attention into the things they can control, like their attitude and that kind of sense of connection and, and bringing their spirit into the world. And I believe that when you put your energy into those things that you can control, you actually have an influence on the physical uh, part of it, right? I mean, if there's a physiology of stress and the brain can get set up for being stressed and so on, and there's a physiology of relaxation and the brain and the brain gets very good at kind of settling down 
that system, there's also a physiology of love, a physiology of connection, a physiology of gratefulness, gratitude, right? And that's, that's that meta signal that's going to say to your body, so whether the mechanism is a fear, a, a physical or some type of energy or some type of spiritual, when you're sending that signal, I want to live, I want to love, that's when you're having influence on uh, something that, that can do it extremely well. So that was the second one from Bernie's side. I mean, he also talked about uh, the exceptional patients saw their the cancer diagnosis as a catalyst for their own growth or an opportunity to grow. And lastly, just to um, flush out the last of Bernie's big ideas, at least from my perspective, was his patients were willing to really love themselves, to really care for themselves. Um, and that's that's so extremely important uh, that we use that as a foundation for what we do in our lives each day. Um, so, um, so Bernie uh, was a huge influence on me. I went into oncology for that reason. Okay, so that was my introduction and why, and, and you know, this is all coming back in one big circle. So, excuse me. get too excited here and I'm starting to rant. Here we go. So then in the 19, um, 1990s, I met Alistair uh, Cunningham and he, uh, he has actually a very interesting story himself. So he was from New Zealand originally and was an immunologist, so like a basic scientist, you know, this treatment versus this treatment, et cetera, et cetera. But he came disillusioned with that and was much more interested in the kind of the spiritual and psychological side. What are the qualities of people who do really well? Was kind of starting to get that kind of burning question. And then interestingly, about a year and a half after his change in career, he got a colon cancer diagnosis. And the cancer had spread to the lymph nodes. And essentially at that time, even with the chemotherapy that he got, he had about a one in three chance of being cured of this cancer. Now, he did the work as well, and he actually uh, did a three-month retreat, um, meditation retreat, and had some profound kind of spiritual experiences uh, with that. But essentially, he developed the program called The Healing Journey that was run through uh, University of Toronto, essentially, um, which was basically empowering people, body, mind, and spirit through kind of a, a leveled system. Uh, and so I'm going to share some of his work as well. Um, and the framework you're going to see there at the bottom is like the first level one is just like um, uh, problem solving information, et cetera, et cetera. And then as you work your way up the pyramid, uh, you get into the deeper, deeper psychological, spiritual work. And um, you know, has a kind of, almost like level the level sevens there. And he, you know, teaches very, very profound stuff. But essentially, he's empowering uh, people through stress management, body, mind, spirit, and so on. So that's the framework. And so he became curious about that as well. And then he started to develop this, um, uh, this schema. And you can read at the top, his remarkable cancer survivors were truly open to change. So they started out with an openness and a determination in the will to live, which is kind of the um, strong reason for living, which is the first attribute. And that the belief that healing was possible, right, which makes sense. And then a psychological change happened, but there, there's the work, right, um, that they actually did the work. There's a shift, and that comes out as autonomy that you see more on the left side of the screen and self-acceptance, the right side. So even though there's self-acceptance, there's also proactivity. And ultimately, it came into the kind of, a state of being, that kind of mental, emotional, spiritual sense of being, uh, that is the I want to live being and the zest for life feeling. So that was what he came out as, a, as, as his theory, what he was seeing in the day-to-day -day in his, his remarkable patients. Um, and he also summarized his three A's of the remarkable survivors. And again, you're gonna see this kind of overlap. So autonomy, is that idea that you um, are in control of your own life, that you choose to see the medical system as a resource, but you also choose other resources, but it's your life, your journey, you decide how you want to manifest. 
context. The second one, which I am very a strong proponent of, is this sense of authenticity, truly willing to listen to yourself and not society, not your loved ones. It's like, what does your heart, what does your intuition, what does that deeper um, wisdom tell you? And, you know, to be able to listen and act upon that is the autonomy. And that, he also uh, recognized that acceptance um, of oneself, of others, of life uh, was an empowering place. And I just happened to put a fourth A in there just to make it obvious that there's also the action. So we can come into that space, but we still need to do the work of, uh, for instance, stress reduction or uh, good diet, exercise, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that points to healing factor number two, which is taking control of your health, uh, which is really one of, and in fact, I think one, this is like one of the factors that really is like a mega factor because when you take control of your health, that's the point when you decide um, to use a good diet, to you know, get some advice around supplements or herbs. You know, you're doing those things as a consequence of you taking control of your health. And then Alistair's, okay, there's a diagram here. He, um, uh, maybe I'll just go up before um, uh, there. To explain this, he had 22 patients who um, uh, all had metastatic cancer. So they, they uh, were all predicted on average. So the physicians reviewed the charts, and on average, every group that I'm talking about had an estimated survival of about a year. So this is in 1990. And then prospectively, they gave them the healing journey program, taught them these skills, and also assessed at how involved they are. And you divide them up into low involvement, medium involvement, and high involvement. And so um, you can see in the circles, uh, so predictive survival is in the kind of left side of the graph, the observed survival is in the right side of the graph. You got uh, low, intermediate, and high. The high guys, the high involvement guys, had a median survival of three years compared with about a year for uh, the low involvement. And for a, a control group, the diamonds or the other side, they actually had less chance of survival on average. And a few of Alistair's um, uh, patients who were in the high involvement side, I would, I would call them radical remissions in that they were alive and well 20 years later. So metastatic endometrial cancer in the bone, there's breast cancer uh, to bone as well. So a couple of really remarkable situations. So, take away, doing the work can have an influence on survival. So, the high involvement mentality, here's a quote, um, you know, they have this joy of exploration, welcoming the challenge. They're talking about doing the actual techniques in the morning, starting at something new like a Tai Chi program, uh, and that it actually has an influence on their total being. It's a change in mentality, a radical change in mentality. You can read the quotes there or, or listen to the power or watch the PowerPoint afterwards. They also point to this idea that meditation is valuable, right? So when we can let go of the kind of ego mind and the judgments and that kind of talking mind, that you kind of come back home to the body's natural state of being and, and healthiness. Uh, healthiness. Uh, and it also taps you into something bigger than yourself. Okay, so that, I mean, that points to uh, what Kelly talked about as healing factor number three, which is following your intuition, right? So that's back to this idea of um, the authenticity um, that we have within us. In fact, I would say this as kind of a metaphysical perspective that we have within us something that wants us to heal. However you want to state that, at the most deepest level, we want healing within ourselves. And it's more like unblocking our access to what's there and just listening to what's true for you. Uh, I mean, you think about the nervous system. Uh, there are millions and millions of nerves that are around your gut that are connected to your brain. It's one nervous system. And when you have a gut feeling, you're actually sending messages via the nerves, via the molecules. It's one molecular brain body system, you're sending that information to your brain as well. So you listen to your gut and that can direct your um, journey. Oh, and then just from my own kind of perspective, so that's super important is the, is 
listening to intuition because that will also guide every single other step of your journey. Change the soup. So the cancer cells grew in a certain microenvironment, the molecules outside of the cancer cells that can have an influence on the growth of the cancer cells. And the idea then is to change the soup. Uh, and again, this is uh, from Kelly's uh, book, The Radical Emissions. So radical change in diet. And I'm just going to um, read a few things from, from her book. So she says, no sweets, no meat, no dairy. Uh, no refined foods. I guess the way I would say that is eat food, i.e. not chemicals, mostly plants, and not too much. So radical change in diet. I'd also say that between this factor and the next factor, the herbs and supplements, is really like go to an expert, go to the dietitian, go to the naturopath, somebody who can really direct you and that can help you learn this stuff that can really make a difference. Now, I'd also say that there's no one supplement that's common, so there's no kind of home money, shark cartilage, SIAC, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, uh, this one's not as important. It's more like the healthy diet uh, that makes your body feel strong is the diet that's right for you, and you want the micronutrients from multiple food types. Obviously, fruits and vegetables are extremely important. And again, this is probably a 20-minute talk by itself. And vitamin D is the only supplement I would definitely say that almost all of us Canadians need at least 10 months a year. So those, those are important as part of what Kelly wrote on. And it also just shows, it's like setting the meta message. Uh, here, here's uh, healing factor number 10, which wasn't included in her book, uh, but she actually wrote that this was, this was becoming more and more common as she was doing the more recent uh, interviews. And also, some people are pretty weak at the start of their cancer journey, so they're not able to exercise. But I would say exercise is also critical. I can rant about the benefits of exercise being something that's fun, good for you. Um, uh, but I would I would say put this into one category, which is to recognize that your body is this kind of sacred ves uh, vehicle or vessel. It allows you to extend your hand, to go into the world, to give a hug. And so you want to be able to see this body as something that you really want to take care of as the vehicle for expressing your spirit. Uh, and so it's no longer depriving yourself through, through diet, but more like just taking care of this wondrous body. So change the soup. And that's essentially what I learned through the 90s and early 2000s was that you can influence certain cancers where by changing the soup, by exercising, by getting your veggies, you actually improve your chance of being alive 10 plus years. So prostate, breast, endometrial, colorectal, there are certain cancers that really you can change your soup, make a difference. Okay, so uh, Inspire Health, just an absolutely wonderful organization out of BC. Um, they offer uh, lots of webinars. There's actually excellent resources here from kind of research perspective and so on. You can also see that they, they offer some excellent recipes. So uh, inspirehealth.ca is the website. I uh, highly recommend it. And I'm, I'm pointing it towards you because Hal Gunn, who's on the right side of the picture here, and I've had some good conversations in the past. And out of his teaching and out of what he wrote on Inspire Health, I'm just going to read from our book again and what he believed could actually make a difference in terms of a person's outcome. And he was describing radical remission cases as well. And he wrote, and then I kind of paraphrased in, in our book, um, they tap into their innate healing potential by living an authentic, autonomous, and peaceful life filled with purpose and love. Like, boom, in one sentence, you probably have it. They have a deep belief in their body's ability to heal, and yet don't worry about future outcomes. Again, Howell's teaching. They no longer view recurrence of their cancer or even death as a failure. Instead, put their energy in the things they can control. Again, I'm, I'm using a little bit of Bernie Siegel there as well. They listen to their own intuition and the feedback of their body in creating and following a recovery program. Very good. They release any sense of guilt about about fully loving and supporting themselves. There's the self-love. In fact, there's really good data now around the power of self-compassion. It's not limpy. It's actually a very powerful um, attitude and so on. 
And they also reconnect with their sense of community and reclaim their joy that comes from being of service to others, that forgiving. So you're seeing the same pattern over and over. In healing themselves, they facilitate healing in their loved ones, right? We can be the light for others around us. So thank you, Hal, for your teaching and kind of summarizing that and, and pointing to the truth is the way I, I look at it. Okay, so we'll go for about 10 more minutes. Um, emotional healing, right? So our minds are connected to the bodies. Is the molecules of emotion. It's just not kind of the nerve fibers that are there that we're actually releasing hormones into the body and the hormones communing uh, immune system, uh, endocrine function, um, uh, body tissue. It's all one body-mind connection. And we can... Um, we can kind of suppress emotions or we can have kind of conflicts in the emotional energy. What it's, it's healthy from my perspective is actually be able to flush the system, be able to feel the emotion, flush it through, not necessarily act out and be mean to other people, but at least experience the depth of that and then allow it to pass and not hold on to it. Because we can hold on to those emotions kind of physically or metaphorically or even from kind of an energy medicine perspective. But there can be blocks in the system. And so if we can unblock and allow the body's natural healing potential to flow, then you are able to better manifest that healing potential. So, um, so Kelly talks about releasing suppressed emotions. And so I would also say it's probably helpful to, uh, to see a therapist, for instance, and to do that work and to allow your body to kind of shake off the, the wounds and the trauma and, and do that deeper work allowing that state to come back into the flow zone. So um, lots of work to be had potentially at that level. Um, now, interestingly around positive emotions, I'm not saying be happy, put on a false face mask. We can, through setting intention, through being grateful, uh, through practicing techniques, because your brain is either in the kind of wise, compassionate state or the stressed, irritable state. And so by practicing coming back home to your kind of default loving, caring state, you can actually feel happier. So right, so there's some work to be had around that. And we know that people that are lonely and angry and frustrated often have worse kind of outcomes at times. So there's things we can do around that. So emotional healing is, um, is very important. And just say, do your work on, uh, on this front. There's an American uh, native tale about um, the, the grandmother who's coming near the end of her, her life. And she's approached by her grandson, who's a teenager. And, she, and he says to her, grandmother, how is it that you're so kind, you're so wise, and people want to be with you? And you exude you this sense of energy and, and happiness. And, and it's just so wonderful just to be with you. And how did you do that, grandmother? And the grandmother says to the grandson, when I was your age, I realized that there were two wolves in my heart, the wolf of love and the wolf of hate. And depending on which wolf I fed it would be the wolf that would grow throughout my lifetime. It's a metaphor for what happens to our brains. Like, you, you know that wonderful, grandmotherly, wise person. How did she or he get there? It's usually she. How does she get there? She practices. She practices just those states of mind. There's a huge sense of kind of neuroplasticity, the ability to change your mind in that more positive, more loving state. So we have the capacity to do that. I'd also say that to expand beyond the kind of individual, to be able to accept support. When we hug, we release oxytocin. When we ask for help from other people, when we offer help from other people, release this hormone that is a very healing hormone in our body, it's actually anti-inflammatory and so on. And a lot of people are kind of programmed, especially in the Western culture, not to reach out for that support. But um, Kelly's uh, book was clear that the radical omissions folks were able to connect within community to accept the love and care of others and really nurture that and to uh, be nourished by that within our soul. So the healing factor is, you know, such a powerful medium of, of we humans who are so wired for this. And lastly, um, 
the last factor is this deepening spiritual connection. And it's not really to do with kind of faith or dogma or, you know, traditional um, teachings. It has more to do with um, a, an internal perspective, a, a personal perspective of feeling connected with something bigger than oneself. And I would simply offer this idea is that there is this element within ourselves uh, that is our spirit uh, that can be the observer consciousness. And that consciousness is very, very peaceful and caring and loving and wise. And we can hold our lives at this level and still be suffering at a kind of a psychological level, like walking along uh, the beach during a hurricane. I mean, it's like a cancer diagnosis and that there's a lot of chaos and the wind and sand and waves and everything and a lot of turbulence. And yet that same hurricane being viewed from three miles off is a very peaceful, beautiful cloud or 40 feet below the water is also very calm as the waves are breaking up top. Uh, and so just to say that we can be suffering emotionally, like be hurting psychologically, and yet be tapped into something that's very peaceful, very calming, that holds our lives. And that's the spiritual connection that can really help empower us too. So it's there for us as we develop, as we slow down, as we practice these techniques. So that's the ninth factor of her nine healing factors. Um, I wanted to point you to our website at healingandcancer.org. So we have the healing program, which really does cover those bases from information, medical system, body, mind, and spirit, including, as you can see at the bottom of the screen there, what you need to do today, because you really can have an influence at all those uh, levels. So I encourage people to use that if, if they want to. Uh, you can also order our book, uh, The Healing Circle Online. It's the teachings from an entire weekend retreat, along with uh, every second chapter I mean, I actually didn't even talk about the remarkable cancer survivors in our book. If you, if you got into our book, you had a good chance of being alive and well many, many, many years later. So uh, it's a remarkable, amazing people. And when you hear that wisdom, when you see that strength, it's, you're recognizing it from within yourself. It's like resonating within you is the takeaway. So, so we'll, we'll stop here uh, and offer questions and then... Uh, right near the end of the seminar as well, Allison will be able to um, share us this last slide. But let's just go to questions next if everybody, anybody wants to. Just a reminder to everybody that you uh, can enter a question in the window to your right. If you do have any, we'll just give you guys a minute just in case. So far, no questions. I guess your presentation was just that good, Rob. It's so clear. I'm seeing somebody maybe in the chat box there. I'm not sure. Not to worry. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think we're okay. So I think we might be.